This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. All right, welcome back to Transparency, everybody. Uh, we are joined by Stella O'Malley today. Uh, she is a, I think everybody listening, watching, probably knows Stella quite well, but uh, she's a therapist from Ireland, um, the founder of Genspect, the author of the new book, Bullyproof, uh, Bullyproof Kids, I can speak, <laughs> and uh, Notable to Sister. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> one of the first well no there are probably many but anyway <laughs> not that old <laughs> uh, uh, awesome yeah. welcome Stella thanks so much for being here lovely lovely to to finally get on this show um myself and Sasha are running the wider lens podcast and you're running your podcast and you know the similarities we go at it a different way but it's we do have similar similar kind of uh perspectives so it's great to be here yeah, I was going to include that. I forgot. I was going to conclude the the fact that you're, uh, yeah, the, the wider led podcast. But I think I think everybody is well aware. So yeah, 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 yeah. No bother. <laughs> no bother at all. Myself and Sasha are starting, and we're going to have a, a little break, just for a few oh, weeks. Because, okay. Ah, we've been exhausted. We've been working so hard on the Pioneer series. We've been doing this Pioneers, and we've been, you know, we've 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 interviewed loads of people. We had to do a lot of work around it. And frankly, we've got a huge amount of online um, pushback, yeah. you know, an awful lot of an awful lot of um, attacks were made. And what we were trying to do with the Pioneer series was just explore everybody who had worked back in the day around yeah. gender. Yeah. And uh, we, we're both therapists, so we're, we're not going to challenge. We're just going to find the information. We just want to hear what they're thinking, where, where they're at. And us not challenging and uh, just left us open to being really an incredible level of, of, of um, attacks has happened. And so we've been pretty tired. And so we're going to take a little break and then move on uh, back to kind of where we were originally with, with our podcast, which is discussing the psychology of gender. I'm really glad we did the Pioneer series. I think it's really interesting, but didn't expect that much, that much extra work involved in trying to explain why we would have in, interviewed you know ray blanchard and things like that yeah it is so interesting when people just assume that because you're speaking to somebody that you're automatically endorsing everything that they're saying um it's such a strange it seems like a very recent perspective um but uh we don't do that either we don't like we have people on uh, obviously from all walks of life talk to them about their experiences aaron's obviously a therapist i myself aaron k I myself am, am not, but my motivation in this is just to hear everybody's story, their experiences, you know, what this specifically has felt like transition or, or gender dysphoria, what it specifically feels like to them. And the act of challenging, like, it just doesn't make any sense that you would do that. You know, it's like, this is your perspective, your story. I'm not here to tell you you're right or wrong. So. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to get the full story from somebody, you bring them out and you give them the platform to give them their full story. Yeah. And then yeah. you can analyze what is good and what is bad about the various aspects of the work that has happened. I think it's a fundamental aspect of of delving into the pioneers work is to give them the, the space to discuss to discuss. Like these people have studied, you know, uh, gender for 40, 50 years. They're so mm -hmm. far ahead of us. But you're right, Aaron T, about this guilt by association. If yeah. I, if I, yeah. if I, if if you interview somebody and once back in 1989 they said something that you don't <laughs> that your your listener doesn't agree with, apparently we should we should uh, be all condemned, which is extraordinarily like tactics from the TRAs. Yeah, that I, I would have thought it's just not it's an activist kind of tactic that really I have no interest in. You know? Yeah. And you're right. If we want to open up the broader conversation, which I think is the goal for both of our podcasts from different angles and perspectives. But we're both just trying to open up the conversation 
and broaden our understanding of the whole thing, including some of the parts that maybe make us uncomfortable or some of the, you know, the, the darker, uglier aspects of what's happened. But who's going to come and talk to us openly and honestly and feel comfortable opening up that conversation if our approach is attack and confrontation? I know. I think people think, honestly, some people think that they are going to eliminate um, um, people like yourselves who are transitioned. They're going to get everybody to slap their forehead and revert to their biological sex. And I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think um, we can work like that. But that's the vibe, I guess. That's the vibe that that's the kind of end goal. And I'm like, you know, for yourself, Aaron Kay, particularly, like I can just imagine n- n- nothing to you, Aaron T, but like, I don't know the song. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, what the hell are you going to do if you try and go back? Like, just. Well, not, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, the physical reversal, but also this, the damage it would do to people in my life. Like, how many. I've already been through a major upheaval when I transitioned and all of, you know, how destructive that can be and how hurtful that can be to to people around me, right? And why would I want to do that all over again and and disrupt my kids' lives and my wife's lives and you know, it it has far-reaching implications to to detransition. Massive, massive. I think there's an awful lot of people who think just like people think like I married somebody and I could have married somebody else, but I'm married and I'm going with it. Or I moved, you know, to Alaska and really and truly, if I had my life over, I wouldn't have moved to Alaska, but I have. And now I'm here and I'm going with it. I think, isn't that what we make out of decisions all over the place in life? We ultimately, we think to undo would be so destructive. Yeah. It's, it's not really an option. All we can do is work with what we have now, right or wrong. Yeah, definitely. If you want to tell us, Stella, kind of like how you got embroiled, I mean, obviously you're, you, you founded Genspect, you're um, spending a lot of time with that today, but like what is, um, it'd be interesting to hear like kind of the, the you know, the things that happened in your life and in, in your therapy work that led you to, to kind of be aware of the, of the trans uh, situation and that it needed to be discussed. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. I am... Um... I, I was like yourselves insofar as I think the three of us were all born biological females and I had a very intense experience as a kid where I wanted to be a boy and I think I would have been a great boy and I it was very it was very intense for me and it lasted for many years and then I pulled out of it so I would have been the classic in the you know the, the 80% desistance I was in that 80% desistance I desisted from my own steam, having been very, very heavy in the weeds of it, I, I moved out. When I first, I, oh, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but yeah, so I, I did desist. This was way back in the 70s, 80s, and I moved on. Now, I did continue to have an awful lot of body problems and different body image problems and stuff, but that particular kind of challenge of um, I should be a boy, I left it behind because I had a very strong feeling during puberty that nature was bigger than me that I couldn't fight it and that basically you have to go with it because you're not as big as nature. You're not, you can't challenge nature. That was the very strong lesson I got out of puberty. It was, I'm not in control here. Nature is imposing upon me and there's nothing I, I don't have. It was like trying to stop the, the ocean. Do you ever have uh, waves? Right. Like if you have ever been tucked under by a, by a, by a tide, it's like, this is so much bigger than me. This is so much bigger than me. I remember specifically feeling like that. It's like, oh, wow, OK, right. This is I'm way outplayed here, which obviously I was because I was a 10 year old kid <laughs> and uh, nature was, was pummeling me all over the place. It, it is I so I'm sorry to, 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 to jump in there, but it's, it's just such in contrast with what kids are being taught today. Essentially, like your body is like yours to kind of mold however you want it to be. It's just completely, um, yeah, the opposite perspective of that. So sorry, go on. You're so right, but but I suppose I was on my own with it. I I didn't have right. a kind of a, yeah, I didn't have a a, a a different option from that, and that that was a kind of like that was the world I was li- living in. It was very much definitely 
the kind of back in the day, you you were left to your own devices to find your own philosophy, to find your own psychology that would pull you through in life. Nobody was sitting me down to discuss it. Nobody. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a very, very lonely experience. It was very isolating. I was all on my own and that was sad. However, with that, for me, not for everybody, I know other people were left in, in the wilderness. I found a lot of strength. I, I, I found my strength. Um, and I don't really know what to say about that because I think these days I meet so many children these days and they never found their strength. They never had the opportunity to find their strength. And I don't want to inflict the loneliness that I had on them. And yet I, I, I find it sad that they have no consciousness of, of what strength that they might have. So it's like, God, you know that phrase where my, my father used to say it all the time, too far east is west. It really feels like we've swung too far the other <clears> way and, so many kids are, are feel like they're very powerless and they don't feel strong. Anyway, I grew up and I had my adventures as we do. And ultimately I went to college in my early thirties and I became a psychotherapist. And I enjoyed, uh, from the moment I, I, the first day of my first class, I was like, yeah, I'm in the right job, this is it. And I'd been flailing all over the place until then. And um, had had babies and I started writing and I wrote a couple of books, a few mental health books around parenting and things like that, Cottonwood Kids. And and um, somewhere along the way, I was in a cafe in my in my town in Burr and I read about a person from Canada called Corey Doty and Cyril Doty. Do you know who I'm talking about? So Corey Doty is a non-binary and Corey Doty gave birth to a child called Cyril. And Corey fought against the Canadian government for the right to raise their child as you, not F, not M, not female, not male, but you, which stands for either unassigned or unknown. Hmm. And yet this child of the non-binary person who's called Corey Doty, this child was a perfectly healthy baby. So this was a, a, a pure example for me of a parent inflicting their politics and their ideology on a child. Now, I'd been noticing the trans debate had been getting stranger and stranger. And I used to always think, where am I in all that? This is, this where, where, where am I? This all seems all very bizarre. It seems to be rolling along in a very weird way. I do remember the 90s when the T was added to the, to the LGB at, acronym, even though it was called different names. But I remember the T arrived in and me saying to everybody, but there's no place for that T in there. That's a separate kind of feeling. It's a separate condition. That's a separate thing. A very sure ground that these are two completely separate things. But I wasn't gay. So people were just like, I don't know why you're talking about this. <laughs> yeah, right. I remember thinking, why don't people see that this is astonishingly strange that these two groups are being merged together without any co- conversation or any kind of process of two different needs, conflicting needs, actually, and um, something that needs examination. But anyway. So then when uh, I read this article about the non-binary person who gave birth to the perfectly healthy baby and then fought the Canadian courts for the right to have them called unassigned, you, and won, I just thought, oh my God, I have to, I have to, I have to say my piece. And I'd said it to my husband a good few times before. I'd said, I really should write about trans rights matters and trans issues because I have my own experience, which he, of course he knew about and like I don't see any anywhere that I'm being heard my version of of life nobody my narrative which is apparently quite common nobody's ever said it so and then I came home that day and I says that's it I'm writing this article I'm I'm no way so I often wrote for the papers at this stage I often because of the books I'd written what year would this have been that that unambi or the unassigned the, the the birth certificate uh case what year was that oh I'll tell you exactly 2017 Oh, it was okay. the summer okay. of oh, okay. 2017. Okay. Yeah, Cyril Doty, uh, D-O-T-Y. And it was a small story, but it was a huge story, if you think about it. It was like, and for me, it was the, oh my God, we're, we're losing the run of it. So what's this you business for a child? Now, I do come from Ireland where politics are very strong with the North and things like that. And it was very, 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 because my own experience is very well aware of how parents can in inflict politics on a child and so children can be grown up into very for example in Ireland very republican families which means 
that there was this very heavy emphasis on, you know, the Northern Ireland, the politics. There was an awful lot of emphasis around that. So I, I was very well aware of the concept of parents inflicting politics on a child and how that's a really very dubious thing to do. So I wrote the article. I remember my husband kind of started smiling at me thinking. So way back in 2017, it was kind of obvious. Well, well OK, there'll be a bit of pushback on this one, but <laughs> knock yourself out. And I did the article. There was a bit of pushback. There was no major pushback, just a bit of pushback. You know, one of those article comes and goes. But from that, I was asked to do a film. And the film I did was Channel 4 in, in 2018, which was in the UK. It was a big deal. And it was called Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. And the premise of the talk could be any of this, you know, 4,000, 5,000 percent rise in, in girls um, seeking medical transition. Could any of them be like me mm -hmm. who had a very intense experience for many, many years as a kid and then grew out of it? Where are they? And I was told it was transphobic to ask that. And I, I got swept into a world that I, I had an idea that I was going to be really, uh, really fraught. I did know that this was a very kind of heightened world. I remember everybody around me told me not to do it, apart from my husband who said, go for it, <laughs> which was lovely. <laughs> everybody else said, don't touch it. This is really dodgy. And I, in I went and I did it and it was a very interesting year and I'm glad I did it. And we, we kind of, we interviewed in that film we interviewed the first detransition woman, to my knowledge, that was seen on mainstream TV. And her name was Kale. And we also interviewed, you know, a, a kid who was on puberty blockers who had, you know, quite severe autism. And uh, we also interviewed quite a few people who had transitioned at a young age and really hadn't been told what was the road ahead. There was, you know what I mean? And um, it's, it's some years now since the film, and there was a lot of things about the film. I didn't even know what autogynophilia was until halfway through that film. I didn't know I'd never heard of lesbian erasure. I was coming very much on the basis of this is an ordinary person who's interested in mental health, and let's see what um, emerges. So it was good I didn't come with all this knowledge, if you follow me. That was the point yeah. of me. The point of me was just to check it out. But the... Uh, it's 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 pretty shocking to me that the only clip that is ever seen from that film that showed the first ever detransitioned woman that showed this child with autism and, you know, really serious issues locked up in his room and on puberty blocks that showed all that. And yet the clip everybody sees is the one of me talking with Debbie Hayden and Debbie Hayden is a trans woman and she was kind of a very incidental part of the film. It wasn't the emphasis at all. In many ways, Debbie Hayton, as she would admit herself, was wheeled in to point out that there are trans people who find this new phenomenon very problematic. Here's one of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that was definitely a small part of the film. And in that interview, I, I certainly had no idea about autogynophilia at the time, but I, I um. I interviewed uh, Debbie's wife, Stephanie, and I've since become friendly with her. And um, I did make lots of mistakes. There's no doubt about it. But I, I don't think that really matters because I think making mistakes is perfectly um, forgivable thing to do. I think what, what really matters is that Stephanie got a platform and Stephanie got an opportunity to say it was devastating for my family. And um, it really, really hurt me and my family, it is a serious thing to do. It has serious consequences. And so my fumbling around with my stupid words, they weren't good, but honestly, like I say, I, there was a lot I didn't know and it wasn't the focus of the film. Did I know about trans kids? By God, I did. Was the title of the film trans kids? Yes, it was. Was that my focus? Yes. Debbie was like, yeah, here, hello, trans person never met you before, how's your family? I'd imagine that was really intense on your family. Yeah, it was. Let the woman tell her story. I'm talking about Stephanie. Let Stephanie tell her story. Stephanie told her story. Great, thanks, job done. We have shown that transitioning in middle life is a very difficult and challenging thing for people to around that person. And we've also shown, more importantly in my world at the time, was that some people who transition say, What's going on now is not appropriate. 
children transitioning is not about me. That's all I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Secondary story was like, yeah, I, honestly, that's so devastating on your family. You know, God bless you. I, I, I wish you well, but wow, I'd say that was really hard. But it wasn't my main focus. My main big thing going into that ha house was, what do you think about uh, trans kids? You're a trans person and you're against it. Okay, well, that shows that this is a very complex field that needs a lot of analysis. Anyway, to this day, all I ever see is people pulling apart that clip of me with Stephanie, that clip with me with Debbie. And I just think all, all that great stuff we did about the detransitioned mm -hmm. woman and Kale and it all got lost because people want to really, without a doubt, target and um and pull down debbie because they hate her and as a result they hate me because i i i'm friendly with her it's and is that coming from the from the trans activists saying how, okay that's what i that's the impression i was getting because when i when i watched it i only watched it actually like six months ago like not long ago did i did i first watch that uh it was and i was i was blown away that in 2018 you were able to interview a trans widow essentially to hear her perspective like like that's 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 what i would interpret to be the controversial thing is you're letting like <laughs> and i'm probably gonna get in hot water for phrasing it this way but you're basically letting somebody who's silenced by society who's basically like if you speak about how negatively this impacted you and your family that's obviously transphobia like that's how that's understood now and and even at the well, time was, certainly yeah at the time like people are saying oh you wouldn't have got that film made uh, uh it, that film went through so many edits it was just an incredibly difficult process and it was only that we had very staunch defenders that that film got through. We got complaints to uh, the producer, above producer, right up to the top. People tried to cancel that film. The the, the and those were on the trans heavy, activist side. That was from the trans activist okay, side. Okay. Heavy, heavy, heavy editing went into that film, and that's where I was very much like a horse trader. Insofar as I was allowed to say this. But they, I had to say that, if you follow me. And if I said this, I had to say that. And yep. it was every single thing was, was trading. And I remember the film was to go out. Imagine the film went out on a Wednesday. And I was dragged up to Dublin on the Tuesday. I live about 100 miles from Dublin. To add in an extra sentence to qualify what I had said. Mm. Because that's how intensely <clears throat> controversial it was at the time. It was the most edited piece of film. Like the guy who I, I did the film with, Ollie Lambert, he's a director. He'd made over 30 films all around uh, war zones, Israel, uh, Palestine, Syria, all those. And he said, by far, this was the most difficult film. And straight after our film, Trans Kids, he did a film about Israel and Palestine. And he said it was a good deal easier to get both sides from Israel and Palestine to speak than it was. We didn't get, we didn't get Nah. both sides for our side because for our film because uh the trans activists wouldn't speak to us the tavistock wouldn't speak to us the tavistock who are now under report and have had um an analysis that was really quite um um critical of them they wouldn't speak to us nobody would speak to us and so we were we were doing something that was very much had a very much of a focus of hang on huge percentage of children have been medically transitioned should this be happening and like I say, it's a source of, of huge shock and distress to me that um, people who are proposed, who, who say that they're against transitioning kids um, decide to focus completely and utterly on a side interview with Debbie because it's all about um, Debbie Hayton and I suppose the trans widows. I had never heard the phrase trans widow at the time. <laughs> didn't know what autogonophilia was at the time. There was a lot I didn't know at the time. And I wasn't my focus, if I'm honest. Most of the yeah. viewers, and that's, I think, when people are in the, this this kind of debate for, for a long time and they kind of know all of those nuances, forget yeah. that the average person doesn't know all yeah. of those nuances. So the fact that maybe you were, um, you know, maybe a, a little bit naive about some yeah. aspects of the debate, I think actually it was a strength of the film because you ask questions that the average person would want would to, ask. to ask yeah, yeah like so exactly. i think it, it i asked i remember thank you because i i asked 
in exactly where you're going in that green kind of way i said to stephanie debbie's wife i said uh, so do you have sex like i was like what is going on like what is this? Yeah. And, uh, i'd say now that i i'm now that i know this world i'd say it's quite likely i wouldn't have asked mm. other things you know what i mean that that naivety allows you to ask questions that you wouldn't ask these days and I remember where I was when I first heard the concept of autogynephilia I was in James Caspian's uh kitchen he was making me tea and um he said you know I was talking about everything that was going on and I was saying how come there's all these middle-aged men transitioning I interviewed this person and he's a middle-aged man and why would they be transitioning and he says well have you heard the concept of autogynephilia and I was like sorry what who <laughs> and then he described it and I was like Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like everything kind of, you know, when you hear a concept, you just go, oh, let me think about this because this is kind of shocking and unusual and takes time to register. I remember that. Yeah. I want to say two things out there. Like in journalism, the, the trick is to basically pretend to be ignorant on a subject that you're not really ignorant on so that no, you can lead the to audience. I, and so I, totally watching that, I, I thought you kind of had the same knowledge you have now, right? And so I was assuming, I was, so I was like, oh, she's doing a great job just playing like layman interviewer here. But no, you were completely, that's funny, okay. <laughs> And so my uh, then the second thing I wanted to say is um, with, the, with the whole autogynephilia thing and how ignorant you were to it. Well, I that's the case for most females in the trans community, too. Like we I was in there for eight years, oh, yeah. like without before I knew it. Uh, Aaron, you learned about it recently, too. You were kind of emboldened or in, in, um, in there for like uh, 15 years. Um, it's, it's because I, okay. it's just not something that we intuitively understand. It like, it does not, I would see trans women, most of them were lesbians. It felt kind of blasphemous to go like, wait, you've just, you're straight man then. Like it, it, like it didn't, it felt blasphemous to let your mind go there. And so you just sort of accepted it. Most trans women are lesbians, that's weird. Um, and then, but I never thought anything about like the, um, like what, okay, what would motivate you to upend your life in this manner and, and to put yourself in a situation where you are, you know, quite, quite demonized by society at large. They're not really fans of, of um, obviously male people being, you know, displaying that, that level of, of uh, femininity um, or, or performing that level of femininity. Um, and so it, it was like, I never even, I never really thought it just didn't, like, that information um, has been so swept out of yeah. the trans community that yeah. I had no idea. And yeah, yeah. that, that gen yeah. genuinely that reassures me because yeah. sometimes when I think of myself in the kitchen in James Caspian halfway through the film, and I think, how the hell did I not know? I didn't even know yeah. the word. I've yeah. never even heard yeah. the word. And I went, what? What's that? Sorry. And yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm yeah. like a mental health. I'm a professional. I'm and I, I, I've always, until this very moment, I've always been a little bit ashamed that I had never heard of it till that yeah. moment. And now I'm thinking, hang on, if you're trans men and you hadn't heard of it, well, that makes it a bit more. But there was one other yeah. part of the film. It's funny, when I'm thinking back on it now. And I, I regretted this so much. I, there, it was, I don't know if you remember, Aaron, uh, when, we, when you watched it a few months ago, there was a brilliant scene in Bristol where all these trans activists attacked the building. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. it was really good. Best part of the film. And, you know, we went down there very much to see if there was something going to go down. And I remember on the way down, Ollie, the director, was saying, now maybe there might be, there might be an attack. There mightn't be. We're just going to see a women's. This is what it was. We're just going to see this women. We were very, very, there was no way, there was no, we couldn't anticipate that there'd be an attack. Do you follow me? So yeah. we went down yeah. and it was like tumbleweed when we down, went down. There was a summer's day and it was so quiet. And we were outside. Just for context, kind of this, this is a, it's like a, a feminist gathering, right? Yeah. Right. To discuss the GRA, to discuss the Gender Recognition right. Act in 2018, which it hadn't come in. And it was very much in my eyes, a, a, a non-event. There was tumbleweed in this warehouse. Right, there was right. nobody there. And it was like, nothing. An attack? Gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. so like, there's nothing going to happen here. And then we were meeting these women and I was like, hello, pleased to meet you. And that's where I first met. I met Magdalene Burns and I met Posey Parker. 
and I met Miranda Yardley and I was like, hello, Auntie and Julie Bindle. Bindle. I've never heard of any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, these are, and I remember saying to my husband, God, I met so many really interesting people. It's amazing. But I had no idea. Like they were, I was being told by the TV crew, oh yeah, they're kind of big shots. Like this Magdalene Burns is a big shot. I was like, oh really? Yeah, she seems very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't heard of, I wasn't on Twitter. I was technically on Twitter, but I was one of those people who'd never learned Twitter. So I didn't know how to, I bought, no idea, no idea. I hadn't been on it. I did join when the film went out. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was just thinking, aren't they very interesting? Miranda Yardley, I was like, oh, wow, man, really meeting interesting people, really like Miranda. And uh, nothing was happening. And then suddenly we got a huge attack. And these people, they came in and they tried to attack. It was awful. They tried to attack the equipment in the building, which is a really, ooh, a really bad way to attack because it really is a way to cancel an event. Oh, so straight oh the, right, right, uh, right. And I remember being so shocked at the protest. And I remember I went out and I spoke to the people who were protesting and I could see, I didn't know um, about the autism I'd heard. See, the, this data wasn't in, the <clears throat> research wasn't in about the autism. There was a lot of talk, but there was, there was no data. And I could see, oh no, hang on, there's, there's a huge issue here and there's autism. It was just blindingly obvious. I was talking to so many people. And I've, I've since learned, which I didn't know, that there's a huge correlation between people who are autistic and activism. Oh. And I think oh. that's very interesting. Yes. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that strong sense of social justice kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. And kind of fixation and not doing disagreement very well. And mm. everything, you know, there's an awful lot. And that, that was a revelation to me. And I remember, but yeah, my big second regret of it, the first is that I didn't handle the Stephanie interview well. And I said some really stupid, clunky things. I said, well done at one point to Stephanie. And I didn't mean well done, <laughs> well done for staying with your family. I was just like, wow, you've been through a lot. It's mm -hmm. just a kind of an empathetic, Aaron Kay, you'll know what I mean. Sometimes you say a, a, a nice thing to somebody who's just said, I just did things and I, I don't know whether it was right or wrong. And I just think, well, mm -hmm. I've done for being here like, yeah wow you know some sort of acknowledgement of Jesus that was hard but the second thing I, I still annoyed with myself for this Out, outside the film outside there was there was some sort of attacks in the in the Bristol trans activists and I say something like there's fight there's 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 no there's voices inside the building there's not voices outside the building and nobody's listening to each other and they made me say it. And I said, no, 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 I can't say that. And I did say it like a tick, because I was green. <laughs> ah, and I, I said, it. and then I said, no, we have to record something else. And then I said, you know, the women are inside and they've been shouted over and all that. And of course they used the first clip. <laughs> they didn't use the song. And I, I really felt I betrayed the women. I betrayed the women because they had come just to talk about something. They were oh. attacked, it was not right. And it really bugged me that they used the second clip, knowing that I was against that set, that clip. They used the clip that they shouldn't have used, which was where I said, there's voices inside the building and voices outside the building. Nobody's listening to each other. It was wrong. It wasn't a good analysis of it. And um, I really- Like that really famous Trump me. quote of, of there's people on good side, they have the good people on this side and that side. That's how it came across. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And it was not true. And but one, one thing good about that was because they insisted on that line, I went to hell with them about a few other things. I said, no, nope, I'm not going to record mm -hmm. a second version. They wanted me to record. Well, don't, uh, what did they say? Uh, they wanted me to. And I held up and I won. They wanted me to say the NHS doesn't recognize gender dysphoria. However, um, the DSM-5 does. And I said, no, 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 DSM. I'm not, I'm not giving you your stupid NHS, whatever the hell it says. And they were like, it's the NHS, Stella. And I was like, I don't care if it's the NHS. The <laughs> DSM says gender dysphoria, and I'm sticking with the gender dysphoria. So I remember I won that because I lost the other. It was horse trading. I was trading one <laughs> line off another. And I know people are going to slag me off and say I was whinging and I'm giving out and all this. You know, you do something and four years later, you realize, or no, sorry, two weeks later, you realize, did it slightly wrong. There you go. The product is OK. It's enough to be getting along with. I was really proud and I'm still really proud of the film because there's lots of things, especially the detransitioner, Kale. That was the big thing for me. I'm really, really proud we got her story out. 
I think it was devastating. It was sad. She had a mastectomy. She had a very similar childhood to me, but she got caught online. She ended up transitioning and she ended up detransitioning some years later. And it was a devastating story. And by the way, now she has moved on. She's got married and she uh, has her own business and has left the whole trans thing behind. So that's nice. It was, I mean, it was just incredible that you were able to get that film, you know, produced and aired on mainstream television. So, yeah, it makes sense that you'd have to kind of concede some area and, you we know, did. haggle for, for other things. It's, yeah, the, the final product was, yeah, maybe there could have been things that were, you know, said differently, but I thought it was, it was really powerful and really impressive. Do you really? Because I think, I often think if somebody watched that, I think it would be a bit insipid. Um, but at the time, it felt powerful. Oh, Certainly. I'm American. Our television is very insipid. So, like, <laughs> um, I but, haven't watched it in a long time, but I was I was very proud of it at the time. And, and you I also am. have to watch it from the perspective of somebody who's not embroiled in this. And like yeah. us now, we're like we know all these intricacies and uh, the arguments on every side. But the average person watching that watching Channel Four on a random evening doesn't know all that yeah, stuff. That's so. And that's, to this day, that's the only people I'm interested in. I want right. to talk to the middle ground, the ordinary person who's just going, what's going on here? And I remember fully enough, another one of those phrases, I remember Madel Mag Magdalene Burns at the Bristol thing. I was like, oh, she's a very nice person. And she started talking about lesbian erasure. And I was like, what is she talking about? I was, like, I was just like, what the hell? What? Sorry, erasure? Yeah. Like erasure? What the hell? How are they being erased? I remember that. Just it is really interesting when when uh, people, you know, just 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 your good, you know, well-meaning individuals who want to be, uh, you know, good progressives or whatever, uh, you know, supporting of the whole LGBT. And when you realize that there's a conflict between the the L G the L the G and the T, you're like, wait, these are kind of actually contradicting interests. It's kind of uh, it's difficult to wrap your mind around because you've, we've all just been absorbing the branding of LGBT for so many years. Very much so. And then after the film, so many people contacted me, an awful lot of people who were kind of lost in transition. That was really noticeable. And they were the saddest emails. People who said, you know, I, I, I saw your film. I transitioned 15 years ago. I wonder now, should I have? I'm living with it. That was, that was a really common email. And it wasn't one I anticipated. Mm. I, lots of other ones I anticipated. I didn't anticipate so many of them. And they've always lingered in my mind as people I think are lost in this whole thing. I don't know what I want to say about that, but it's just something mm. that I, I always call them the people lost in transition. And I think, I don't think there's enough attention given to that. I think when you make a massive decision, you're forced for the rest of your life often to defend it. It's almost like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost like if you, if, you, if you join something at a young age and then you're stuck in at it, you know? But um, yeah, a lot of parents contacted me as well. And um, I, I became a little bit more interested in the parents kind of situation, but I didn't jump into the whole gender thing. I continued on as a therapist. My, I released my book Fragile, which was about anxiety the following year. I had an awful lot of difficulty with the Irish media. I was kind of vaguely well known in the Irish media. And then suddenly I'd come out with this film. And so there was a major kind of what is she doing? And, you know, I could have easily been cancelled. So I spent an awful lot of time being very careful about how I was and, you know, how that was happening. So it was a very stressful couple of years. And then finally, through pure, relentless kind of requests, I realized that parents needed some attention. And I was at the first ever, were either of you at it? You probably weren't because it was in Manchester in the UK. I was at the, the first ever D-Trans conference. It was in Manchester in November 2019. And these parents came up to me in the toilet and they said, could you start something for parents? We're, we're really lost and desperate and we don't know where to go. And I said, yeah, sure, well, sure, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the way you think, oh, I must, mm, yeah. And then a few months later, COVID happened in March. And it was actually, I think it was today, uh, two years ago, mm. that uh, I started, you, you know, one of the parents said, come on, will you do it? And I said, okay, I'll run a therapeutic online support meeting. We'll see who comes. And she said, great. And I think today, two years ago, is when we first had our first one. It was COVID time. And I suddenly had loads of time because I usually give a lot of talks. And suddenly they were taken from me, public talks. They were taken from me at all this time. So I said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll run one. And I had no idea what I was getting into there. 
because that online talk, it wasn't an online talk, it was an on, online support me meeting. It, within a week, there was two meetings a week. Within the three weeks, there were three meetings a week, four meetings a week. And these parents were traumatized. And I suddenly felt I'm going into a hole. You know that we need a bigger boat. It was like, oh my God, I have just opened up a cauldron of pain. And I've never, I, I've had a very complicated and colorful and difficult life. But the pain I saw in those parents' meetings was like something, it was harrowing. I used to come down afterwards and my husband would be down by the fire and I'd be going, oh my God, these parents, they're devastated. And these parents were almost always parents of children with many diagnoses, not just one diagnosis, autism, ADHD, anxiety, eating disorders. These are parents who had really, really, really troubled kids who had a lot of trauma behind them, lots of bullying, and who found the online trans community and the child just decided that this was the decision, this was the, the, the answer to all their many complex problems. And the parent was like, that's just one diagnosis. That's just one diagnosis. You've got eight. How, how can you just kind of, how can one diagnosis trump all the rest? And these parents, and these were parents of children who had med medicalized, children who hadn't medicalized, children who were as young as like 11, children who were getting estrogen and testosterone on the black market. They were bringing it into school and selling to other kids in the black market. I had no idea of what was going on. And so that quickly spread. It was all around COVID. I went into this weird world uh, where it was incredible amount of pain. And I realized something needs to be done for this devastating massive group of parents they were coming from australia from america from the uk from spain from ever italy everywhere for these meetings and it was quite quickly so that was the gender dysphoria support network that's what we called it and uh it was it, I, my idea was like you know alcoholics anonymous is aa and with aa is al anon and that's for the families of the people who are addicted so it was run on the concept of al anon so these are families who are impacted. So we did we did um, meetings for pa for fa fathers, and then we did meetings for siblings, all sorts of things like that. And from that, that was March 2020, we started. And it was quite clear within six months that something huge was going on that I, I really felt it's very, very important we do something about it. And as a result, I started saying, somebody needs to speak up for these parents. They're all in a secret life because their families are falling apart and nobody's saying their voice. And they're all saying the same thing, which is my very, very troubled child has fixated on gender as a way of um, kind of relieving all their problems and they're ignoring all the other problems and the doctors are ignoring me. And all the parents, and this was thousands of parents were all saying it. So when I realized there was loads of parent groups and there were all these little secret groups and they were all powerless and voiceless, I thought, well, we'll set up an organization that will give a voice to these parents. And so around about December of, of 2020, still very COVID time, I uh, started to go about setting up something that would be a kind of an umbrella group. And from that, we eventually launched Genspect in June 21. And so that's, you know, nearly a year ago. And the idea was to speak up for all these parents who've been so badly silenced. And um, now we're, we're kind of representing, let me think, 16, um, over 16 different countries 18 different parents organizations and it's thousands and thousands of parents and they're all saying the same thing and the 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 trauma these parents have gone through just watching their child slowly but surely kind of destroy themselves and get unhappier and unhappier and unhappier and the parents are going how is this happening to my child my child is very vulnerable and needs a hell of a lot more attention than just throwing you know, you know, hormones at them. They just need way more help than that. And these are vulnerable, naive kids, very often very cerebral, very often very out of touch with their body. You often feel that they've no kind of, they're not in touch with their sexual feelings and stuff. And they're very um, intellectually oriented, made for queer theory. And when I, when I think about Aaron Kay and the way you said queer theory just exacerbated everything in your mind mm -hmm. the brain kind of you know the, that lovely phrase is it john milton who said you know the mind can make a heaven out of hell and a hell out of heaven 
these kids who are very cerebral are thinking themselves into a huge amount of distress. And it's, it's, it's great that Genspect exists and it's appalling that there's a need for Genspect. I've heard, yeah, so. I agree. I, I've heard parents um, describe their experience as, as they've never felt so emotionally abused until their kids adopted a trans identity because they, they, suddenly these families are caught in a culture war and parents are being told, no, ma- no matter what they do, whether they affirm their kids or whether they don't affirm their kids, they're being told by somebody that they're being horrible abuse of parents. Yeah. And, you know, they're being hit everywhere. And when I first started the GDSM, the, the parents group, I remember telling other therapists that I was going to start these parents group. And the general vibe was, are you sure, Stella? Because <laughs> they're a very intense group. And I was like, oh. I have no doubt they are. Can you imagine? I've got two children. I've got a 14 year old and a 12 year old. I actually, I have good levels of empathy. I'm good at being able to imagine. That's one leap I find very hard to imagine because I don't, I don't know how I'd react, but the anger I would feel to any doctor who inflicted himself between me and my child and sent my child a different direction. It, I just, I wouldn't, be able to contain myself and I I don't know how I see the pain they're in and I don't know I love to help them I try to help them I certainly think I do sometimes but my god it's a drop in the ocean compared to the pain that's been inflicted upon them Mm -hmm. and like you said about the culture wars Aaron like they they've no interest in the culture wars they're like my child is being robbed from me my child has been taken from me and like has now got a mastectomy and their voice has changed and I don't recognize them and they're very unhappy. And um, then uh, what happened was a weird kind of uh, kind of stage left. An awful lot of them ended up with a lot of kind of radical feminists who are saying this is how it is. And this is how our freedom is to kind of um, to, 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 to discuss radical feminism in its entirety and to realize this is a radical feminist issue. And I think a lot of the parents were like, yeah, okay, right, whatever. How the hell do you get my kid out of this? Do you know what I mean? Well, some of the parents were definitely like, this is so insightful and educational because it is, it's a very dense subject. And the radical feminist outlook is very, very interesting and has an awful lot of truth in it. And so I can see how an awful lot of people got into it. But now I think a lot of the parents feel that they've been very, very badly abused by radical feminists. So they feel as well that they, They've been hit by everybody, by doctors, by trans activists, by radical feminists. They've been hit by so many people. They are the most traumatized group I've ever seen in my life. I remember one parent saying to me in a meeting, it wasn't in a meeting, it was just talking to her, actually, she was a friend, but she said to me, for thousands of years, our children have gone off to war. And now these thousands of children are just heading off. They're heading off into this thing and how they come back. How they come back? I don't know how they'll come back. I don't know. You know, there's 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 something beyond all the clever clever words and beyond all the clever ideas. Families are being devastated, and these are just generally normal, kind of high achieving, good families who try to do the bins right and who have you know, organic food and who try not to kind of put an imprint on the world. These are the good types, if you follow me, that are really trying their best. If anything, if I was to say, if I was to say they have a flaw, they probably try too hard in life. That's probably, and I, I you know, very forgivable flaw, but that would be the one I would say, you know. And the parents should be able to trust our healthcare system, right? I mean, they should be. Well, uh, that's what's... And that's what they that's what's really have. interesting because I do lots of different groups and I I do a lot less now and lots of other thankfully lots of other therapists are facilitating and a lot of the parents just like Alan on they're running their own groups which is great because it was it was drawing that first year <laughs> all those groups wow but um what did you say there was something very interesting you just said Aaron and then I forgot it uh, just that the parents should be able to trust the healthcare system. Yeah, with their children. that's the thing. I've started to run a group of parents of desisters. So these are parents whose kids desisted. And the reason I, I, I there's two reasons why I started this group. So there's only parents of desisters go to this group. The idea is one, that these parents must be traumatized by what happened. 
must be like they're walking over a tightrope because they feel that we're just over a dry land, but that's a very scary place to be. And also I wanted to mind them for, well, what did you do? What did you do to help your child? And one thing that's really noticeable is they have all lost trust in the, the fabric of society. They've lost trust in their ability to trust anything from schools to hospitals to doctors to how can they trust? They said, like, um, you know, my, my child, you know, I had to stop attending the pediatrician. I had to stop attending school. I had to do huge. I had to move house because everybody around me was engulfing my child. And I, I just think that lack of trust of you won't trust the world again. It's a huge thing to be taken from you. You can't trust the healthcare system. You can't trust your doctor, your teacher, your, you know, your social worker. When you can't trust that, it's a it's a desolate place to be. Yeah, I can't even imagine what they're going through. They're devastated. And I think we really need to kind of look out for them. So many of them are online and, you know, they're anonymous and they can see why. And they're just they're being pummeled every direction. And that's really what brought me into the debate as well was, you know, in terms of what opened my eyes was was doing the clinical work. And because and, I was working with youth and parents bringing their, their children in because um, their, their kids wanted to start hormones. And I mean, some of the some of the kids, it, it, I think it kind of made sense to everyone in the child's life. I mean, if they were extremely gender nonconforming from a very early age and had been saying ever since they were three this is what I want. This is what I want. And there's still, I mean, I get that there's still going to be disagreement and debate about what do we do with those kids. But the, what really opened my eyes was just the number of kids coming in who had absolutely no sign of gender nonconformity at all at any point in their childhood, but then all of a sudden developed a trans identity and parents are scared. And that didn't make sense to me either like why some of these kids said like no i had no no experience of gender dysphoria at all at any point in my life but they might have had autism or adhd or you know very complex psychiatric histories or developmental histories and just the suddenness of of that trans identity and it was very clear to me that that there was some kind of social phenomenon happening yeah there's probably nothing more alluring in life than to be told you can be somebody, you're very distressed, you hate yourself, you hate every, you hate your voice, you hate your body, you hate yourself. And you really hate yourself in that bitter, you know, way. And you can be someone else. You can be somebody different, with a different voice and a different name. And nobody's allowed to refer to that old, awful person that you're ashamed of and you hate. Nobody's allowed to refer to that. It's nothing, like you'd grab it, yes. Get rid, get rid of this awful person. Let me go to the new, let me go to the new uh, person. So I can see why teenagers grab it with full force and like, get away from me, anybody who's trying to rip that out of my claw. Like, no way, I, I'm going to be the new person. I don't want to be this person. And the idea of you aren't really that person. You know that awful person that you think you are? You're not that person. You're somebody fabulous. Kind of looking like that kid on YouTube that you look at all the time. That's who's going to be you. <sighs> My God, even if you don't have the like autism and stuff, it's so alluring. It's shocking. But just something you said there and there that's interesting. I don't agree with you that those kids with the young and I get where you're coming from, the younger and they have like that was me. Like I had it from the age of three or whatever. Um, and then the maintains, I don't know. I just think, honestly, my feeling is people fixate. People fixate. They fixate on that's the answer. And it's like, well, you can choose that answer, but it's going to really, really, really impact you. In Like a three-year-old wants to be a three-year-old boy. A six-year-old girl wants to be a six-year-old boy. They don't know what it is to be a 36-year-old man. Mm -hmm. So when Jazz Janning was kind of um, saying what she wanted to be, she wasn't envisaging herself at, at 28, 36, 48. And she certainly wasn't thinking because she was six or whatever age she was, she wasn't thinking, um, well, my my pool of my, my likelihood of finding a, a, a loved one is is going to be massively reduced. My the impact of fertility and not having children is going to be 
devastated. She, nobody can understand that until they're really quite old. I was told, weirdly enough, I was told at 25 that I was probably infertile. I had endometriosis and I didn't give a crap. I was like, oh, really? Yeah, really? Oh, do I not have to use uh, contraception? I was like, like, frankly, vacuous. I didn't give a crap. By 32, I was a breastfeeding earth mother. Like, my children. <laughs> I changed so much in that. And that's, frankly, love. You know, I think love. Stephen Levine, we did an, uh, an interview with Stephen Levine on our podcast. And he talked about love. And the transformative and the healing and the depth and the depth and richness love gives you. And how can you talk to that, to the, the three-year-old gender dysphoric, the eight-year-old gender dysphoric, the 14-year-old gender? They don't get it over their head. What the hell would they know? Why would they know their children? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I know I just talked all over you there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and everybody's completely entitled to their own opinion. But that's my own. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't necessarily mean you know that it's clear to me that that those kids with with that persistent childhood gender dysphoria should be medicalized. So that that's that's not quite what I mean. But it's just that there was just these two obvious, very different cohorts. Different. And then that yeah. sort of clued me in this case. What is what are we actually seeing here? Like, why are these kids who who don't even actually seem to have any kind of gender dysphoria? coming in and, and adopting these trans identities. And, and the pattern yeah. does seem to be that their mental health gets, de their mental health deteriorates from the point of, of adopting a trans identity. That they actually seem to be more explosive and having more social problems, not, not fewer well, social problems. That was the kind of shocker for me when I started doing the GDSN meetings during COVID. Um, they were all saying, there, there's no happiness here. They've identified as trans and they haven't stopped crying. They've identified as trans and have barely come out of their room. These are the most miserable, it's the most miserable point of their life. And the only thing they like doing is going online and they tend to their identity as if it's a bonsai tree. And all they do is think about themselves, self, 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 self. And they're not thinking about anything else other than kind of trans politics and themselves in the middle of it. And it's so blindingly obvious this is mental health issues at play here. And it was shocking. My big thing with the GDSN and those meetings was how similar all the stories were. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, there was so much trauma, so many diagnoses, so much distress and so much despair. And I was like, this is nothing to do with what I was. As you said, I was the other group there. And so, and you could see it, by the way, I know I'm talking a lot about Jazz Jennings, but I'm watching the whole series from the beginning. And I find it fascinating. But you could see it when she was in these meetings. She, Jazz Jennings went to these meetings in the middle of the series. And uh, she's clearly meeting all these ROGD kids and she doesn't want to go. And her mother forces her to go. And she clearly has nothing in common with them. And she's looking at them going. And one of the children who was a very ROGD kid explained how she, all Jazz wants is to be a Barbie and to have a beautiful, gorgeous figure and to have lovely big boobs. And you know, that's all Jazz wants. And she's listening to this ROGD kid who is saying that uh, she wants to have a full mastectomy and no nipples and just a blank slate. And Jazz is like, <laughs> like her face is just like, what the hell? What the hell is going on here? I don't know any of this. It's so clearly not her people. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. she doesn't get it at all. Um, I think what's what's happening with, with like what the parents and what what we're all describing here is like there's all these mental health diagnoses that pre that precede the gender dysphoria and then when they're online absorbing the the the, the trans like the, the the ideology of it all they're told that all of like the anxiety the depression whatever just general teenage angst ADHD autism whatever could be the problem it's all because they're trans and so if they if they take, if they attend to the transness, then that will take care of everything else. And also then they're part of, you know, kids have a, especially teenagers, like have a, um, or definitely teenagers have like a, a like a, that, that kind of a need for a righteous drive, right? Something to commit themselves to. And I think this provides that. And then 
but but listening to to uh, to Helena talk about her experience where suddenly yeah the trans thing was going to take care of everything that preceded it but now where she was was still having all of those issues and also having to put on this disguise of being a boy that felt really uncomfortable really um unnatural and she had to kind of deal with all of those things while also like basically just try putting all of her energy into being a trans boy as she put it and uh it's, it's a very it's a very different um uh and again i i also don't think that there's any that there's any point that there's that it's ever correct to medicalize a child no matter what their their um uh, d- d- uh, presentation of dysphoria yeah. is um, but, but there is there is a distinct difference, obviously, like what you're talking about with like with jazz, you know, uh, how, how, you know, Aaron, how we felt like growing up at Sella, how you then then what is the um, what these kids now who have who have kind of uh, uh, absorbed the online content uh, where, where they're coming from. It is it is definitely a distinctly uh, different thing. There's so many things that have become permissible under the banner of trans rights and then it and then quite aggressively defended and you know so i think of things like like the nippleless surgeries or the nullification surgeries or like some pretty we've gone off into some pretty bizarre territory beyond just transsexuals you know the, like the Maybe castration I'll... fetishes that was it that was it the uk that uh, the police kind of crack down on a on a castration um fetish cult that was online broadcasting castrations as part of this new eunuch gender identity that you know i'd never heard of but the w path has a whole chapter on on eunuch gender identity so all these other things are being kind of wrapped into um the whole trans movement that you know, it's taken us into really bizarre territory and i can't even imagine what a parent would feel like if that was one of their their children because i think there was some very young young men who were um a part of that castration fetish cult that that's emerged so i imagine can i mean those 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 young people have parents too and i can't imagine what their those parents are going through yeah when i think back on like i was doing that film in 2018 and now i know my research and i certainly didn't know it then lisa Lipman was getting her paper released that year so no wonder i didn't really know what rapid answer gender dysphoria was I just knew that there was something going on, like yourself, Erin. It's like, these are not me. These kids are not the kids that I was. Mm. This is totally different. I remember that kind of concept, but as well as that, a kind of a feeling that culturally everything is centered on the internet. And my God, we didn't know what we were doing when we brought the internet. We didn't know what we were doing. Letting kids at that internet, Jesus Christ. And it's really noticeable if you look at like uh, that the smartphone became more common than the dumb phone from 2012 onwards in the Western world. So most of us had smartphones, i.e. the Internet in our pocket from 2012. And what do you know, if you look at the, the rates, it's directly attuned to children getting mm-hmm. access to the Internet in a, in a very easy manner. <laughs> And I think it was. Um, uh, uh, have you guys read the the coddling of the American mind, or um, or Jen uh, I Jen, um, yeah. a book that heavily influenced that? And because the, the girls are so much worse impacted than the boys are um, with the, the 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 constant access to social media and therefore social bullying and therefore self comparison or like comparison and like it just um, you know that that the 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 empathizing with basically yeah. an unlimited uh, uh, well, number of, I dis- of people. I discussed this in my book, in, in my book, oh, great. Proof Kids. Yeah, I discussed that very concept about the online issue and how like if, if, if you were to put a gun in every 12 year old boy's pocket and ask him not to shoot it in the next six years, it's unlikely. He would probably take the gun out and shoot it. Do you know what I mean? At some point in those six years because of testosterone, because of that. And um, it's kind of the equivalent by putting a phone in a chi- in a girl's pocket. She will get herself in trouble with relational aggression because girls, mm-hmm. the way girls kind of produce their aggression, they're not like a boy. It won't be a punch or a gun or something. They won't have that. It'll be relational aggression as in I'll slag Aaron K, K- off to get more um, um, friendship from Aaron T. And that's how I work, because that's how girls work. It's all about relational aggression. 
and trying to kind of get one over on the other. Always looking at the power plays, always looking at the dramas and how to manage the conflict. That's what that's what that's how girls operate when they're uh, filled with estrogen. It's it's the way we we operate. It's all about community and it's about contact and it's about getting on with each other and getting one over on your on your enemies in that way. And I discussed the whole kind of power plays around that in in the book Bullyproof Kids for that reason that it's just. It's really sophisticated, the level of online difficulties teenagers get into these days. It's not easy. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I, just, I want to give you a chance to talk about Genspect and, and kind of uh, toot your own, own horn a little bit about just, you know, because I think you're, uh, Genspect is a, a year old now. It'll be a year old in June, so yeah. it's about yeah. nine months. It's a baby. It's nine months old. Yeah. So, in what ways is Genspect representing um, the the parents? Oh, loads of ways. So we have been on on mainstream media, loads of different mainstream media's like Sky and you know Australia, and we've represented um, uh, the parents for lots of lots of sm- submissions for conversion therapy around the world, like New Zealand and. Ireland and and different countries, Finland, just because we we're trying to advocate for parents, and we've we've set up an advocacy service so that parents who are in difficulty with their school, for example, if the kids have social the kid has been socially transitioned by their school, we will intervene on behalf of the parents and speak up for the parents, and we have some really good people who are qualified doctors, qualified in their field and are able to advocate for the parents. And basically the schools have been so dismissive. That's a really strong part of of what Genspec does. And we've produced all these guidances and they've gone down very well. So we've got a guidance. So imagine if you've got a kid and they're going to a therapist, we've got a guidance for psychotherapists dealing with gender dysphoria or a guidance for family and friends for gender dysphoria, where we, because so many of the family and friends, they want to help, they love the kid. They don't understand anything that's going on. And we've got a guidance that they can read and realize that bring the kid out to the cinema, bring the kid out here, there and everywhere. Don't worry about gender. You don't have to talk about gender. You can talk about lots of other things. So we do that with the guidance. We have a guidance for parents. We have loads of different guidance, but the school's guidance is probably the biggest one. And we go into a lot of different staff schools are all around the world. And um, obviously online. And what we do is we give gui- gui- uh, training to the staff of schools. And the staff are really benefiting from it. And I find that this is a door that's halfway open. They generally, these staff, they will have received, there's, there's no sex and gender policies. There's lots of anti-bullying policies in school. There's no sex and gender school policies, not proper ones. What there is, is one kid was trans and therefore we created policy all around that kid. And it's not a kind of, there's no foresight. There's no long kind of term in that. And so we've really helped a lot of schools operate how do they operate within this? Because I find the schools just want the best for the kids. They don't have any gender. They're not, you know what I mean? And people say, oh, they're captured. And I'm like, I don't think they're madly captured. They're just literally going, will somebody help us? We don't know what to do. We have one kind of activist parent on this side saying my child needs to, my female born child needs to be allowed to be into the male be- bathroom. We've got another on the other side saying over my dead body, can this child go into the you know, the male bathroom. And so how to navigate through that. So we do a huge amount of work with schools and training and stuff. And I think that's where we make a big difference. And we just, just last week we ran, which I was really proud of, uh, the D-Trans Conference. So do you remember I said we went, I went to the first ever D-Trans Conference in 2019. So this, as far as I know, is the second D-Trans and it was to celebrate D-Trans Awareness Day and the, well, celebrate, mark, remind people, whatever. <laughs> and uh, the 12th of March, and um, it was it was really powerful. And an awful lot of detransitioners got to speak and say their piece and how the medical profession had failed them and how they've been dismissed. And yet, very like the parents, they've been kind of thrown around by, pummeled by all sides, you know what I mean? Abused by everybody and really badly treated by so many different groups. And so they're, they've really found a bit of power, I think, in themselves and um, I'm really pleased to be able to kind of be part of that because I think they're just they're really they have been so badly treated more so than anybody else I would say they have been you know really badly treated by this thing and so yeah so that's a few things we've done we've done loads 
loads. We, you know, we did a one last thing. We did a Noro GD conference as well, the first ever conference that was on rapid onset gender dysphoria. We had Lisa Lippman speaking, who, who you know coined the phrase, and David Bell, and we had an amazing presentation by a parent who discussed her own child's ROGD and how the child had an awful lot of other diagnoses, an awful lot of other troubles. And afterwards, by the way, the child came home and uh, is now back home. In, in, oh, good. In, in, yeah, it was a really sad presentation. That was, yeah, that like, was a very, very hard presentation to just to, yeah. to witness, right? It was very emotional. It was. Well, that, pair, that child is home now. So. Both conferences and, were fantastic. Yeah. 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 But there's so much in it. There's so much to learn. There's so much. There's so much in this subject. It's very, it's very complex. Highly complex. And, and, and for so much of, of um, uh, society to just kind of pretend it's just this, this totally fine thing. It's one thing. It's fine. We understand it. Let's not, let's not look too closely and let's not peek at it. But there's just so much going on here that's, in fact, that's impacting so many individuals, so many institutions, so many just, it's just bizarre thing to witness. When people try to dumb it down, it's it feels like you know that phrase. It's a, li a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. It feels like that. It's yeah. like come on, like this is so not. People like to pretend it's the same as being gay, and it's yeah. like well, it, like where is the lifelong medication? Where is the kind of change of name and and pronouns and participation from the rest of the world? And it's so different, but it has been it's been very much uh, marketed as being the same as, as, as gay. Yeah. Parents yeah. The gay conflation. Really, hmm? I think parents are really going to change the, the landscape of all of this because when they were, when they were just trying uh, medicalizing adults, I don't know how, what you were like when you, at the point that you um, went to a, to the doctor wanting hormones there. but I know that when, at the point in which I made the decision to transition, I wasn't in my right mind. Like I was, you, you develop such tunnel vision. Once you attach to that idea, you develop the tunnel vision and, and such a strong drive because you're convinced this is the thing I need to feel better. And I think when you're in that state of mind, you're not necessarily um, thinking critically about the care that you're receiving. You know, whereas parents have a different perspective on it. They're taking their children in that they are thinking clearly because they're not in the midst of the, the distress that their child is and they expect certain things from the healthcare system. They expect that, that clinicians know what they're doing, that they understand how to accurately diagnose a problem and they understand how to accurately treat a problem. And I think what I'm hearing from parents is that they're not basic things that we expect and trust from our healthcare system are missing from our healthcare system and parents are being pushed out of the process a lot of the times they're told they're not allowed in the assessment room. Um, these kids are being rushed into something, you know, very permanent lifelong medicalization after a single visit. And it's the parents that are picking up that there's something not quite right with this system in, in a way that I don't think we as, as patients could have noticed. Because, of course, when we're desperate and we want something, a clinician giving it to us after a single visit probably from our perspective is awesome. They're giving us what we want, but that's not necessarily what's best and safest and and most ethical. And and so, yeah, I think I think it's parents are bringing a very different perspective into the conversation in a, in a we, positive way. We also, when we're in it, we're we're. Um, we're kind of looking at our life history from the lens of our current perspective, and so there's a lot of like lies that you can tell yourself. Whereas a parent is seeing the whole the whole of this child's life and the whole of this, this young person's life. And it's like, no, what you're saying now is not actually the reality of, of your childhood. It's not the reality of, of, of how you've been up until the last six months, you know, like, and, and parents can see that a lot more clearly. Whereas when, when you're just in it, like when I was on, uh, on gender, a wider lens, I was explaining to you that even though I was 27, when I, when I saw it transition, I was still very much rapid onset in that I was became obsessively fixated. It was like, this, this is, like there's there was no nothing anybody could have told me that would be like no well, this isn't the way to go that's an interesting point because the more uh, we did we had a great interview with Anne Lawrence who's 71 year old trans woman and on on our podcast and 
I realized the more I've interviewed, and that's why I really want to interview so many people, because I'm like, I want to get to the bottom of this. Like since the 1950s, there's been certain people who get fixated on it. And mm -hmm. my God, they get fixated. And, and Anne Lawrence would be a very good example of some small group of people get fixated on this. And why? And people could just say, oh, autogonophilia. And it's like, well, there's more, there's more than that. You know what I mean? There's, it's just, that's not, that's, that's the quick answer. It's not, it's not the complicated, difficult, real mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in that fixation that people um, get, because I know you can get fixated on anything. You can get fixated on so many different things, mm -hmm. yeah, obviously. And I, I see that as a mental health issue. And I see that as, uh, that is the issue. It's fixation. It's and Debbie know, Hayden, in, in your film, uh, she was saying the exact same thing that, you know, Stephanie, her wife was basically saying, let's slow down, at least slow down. And it was like, it wouldn't even sink in. Like, she was like, no, this yeah. is what I'm doing. This is all I'm going to do. It's like, uh, oh, it's just a steamroller. We got an awful lot of uh, attacks for our interview with Debbie Hayden on the wider lens. And it was one of the most illuminating for me in understanding what goes on preceding transition was when Debbie Hayden spoke about it because Debbie Hayden basically said there was nothing would have stopped me. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. like, boom, I was a steamroller. And I'm thinking that reminds me of some of these kids, not all of them, but some of these kids, these parents are describing, they're a steamroller. They are like, get me, I will step across my dead granny to get that estrogen. Get out of my way, you know what I mean? And I know this because I've, I've uh, worked and lived in, uh, around addiction all my life and I know a lot about it and I know how that just get out of my way mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. get what I want and I can't see left or right I can't even hear you and I'm like that I know that world and if that's what you're dealing with because I think it is mm -hmm. it's compulsion it's like the gambler it's like get out of my way I'm I'm robbing your wallet and I'm getting into that bookies and I can't even hear anybody now when you're dealing dealing with compulsion and fixation it's like okay well now we know what it is now we know what it is whether you want to call it rapid onset or you can call mm. it whatever you want and got all to kind of feel and i'm like i'd actually distill it back to compulsion and fixation and it's like now the therapist could deal with it. let's speak about compulsive behavior let's speak about um fixation and obsessive fixation and how are we doing with this and how can we move beyond that? Is it easy? No. Will some people not get the better of it? 100%. But it's the most, to me, in my world, in my profession, to me, it's the most accurate description of what's going on. And it's only through interviewing people that I figured that out. People like yourself, Aaron, people like Debbie Hayden, that I got. I get it now, you know? Yeah, I've written a little bit about how transition did feel like like an like an addiction in in hindsight because you focus on it and you feel this compulsion to to move forward and i remember feeling like oh you know you start hormones because you do it in stages and i started hormones it's like okay so best, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way but i need the next thing i need the next thing and because you think that i haven't arrived yet and that's why i'm not feeling mm -hmm. better because i haven't completed the transition yet and and it drives you forward to the next intervention and the next intervention so that really didn't stop for me until i reached the end of everything medicine could do i mean i suppose i could keep chasing aspects of it but i you know there's a point where either surgery went wrong or you've reached the end of what what they can do and unfortunately i was on a wait list for some of the surgeries for 10 years so that that i think i might have reached the end of it had i had what am i trying to say I think that delayed the complete, you know, that um, bubble oh, bursting for me. Because... Tell me, that's very interesting. Are you saying that the delay was a good thing or a bad thing? Because that's very. I think in my it was a bad thing in the sense that yeah. because I kept waiting for that last stage. It's like okay, I'm gonna I'm, yeah. I'm gonna feel better when I'm on that last stage. So because I was on the wait list for ten years. You were it, 10 years waiting. It was 10 years waiting for just that last thing, right? And then once I had that, that's then the bubble sort of burst. And it's like, okay, well. That's exactly what Debbie Hayton said. It wasn't until after the genital reassignment surgery that she could stop gripping it. Yeah. As she yeah. went, oh, what is this? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was only when she'd gone to the end of the road that there could be analysis. Yeah. Because until then, you're still on your 
chase. You're still chasing the dragon. Like you're yeah. still on it. Yeah, and I mean, it's it, it's I mean, in this political environment, it's it's scary to say that because I'm certainly not advocating for let's just give everyone these surgeries as right fast away. as possible <laughs> through the bubble burst. But but that is how it works. We are not saying that. We are not <laughs> saying that. To clarify. <laughs> We're trying to have an in-depth conversation <laughs> that is exploring the compulsion and the fixation yes. of this issue. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah, just yeah, I just wanted to because that's definitely not building a case for that. But it, but that's just how it played out for me. That until well, until the drug is gone, you you still want the drug. And so, where do we go with this? And this is for me where I want to go um, with with this issue. I want to build awareness about exactly what you're just talking about, because I think all we can do is build public of all this whole two letters from the psychiatrist and da -da, jumping through hoops. I just think that's almost attractive for somebody who is busy trying to go down the path. Oh, another! I got another letter. Oh, I'm getting. That's just like you're on a conveyor belt. Yeah. yeah, it makes them feel they're going somewhere. No, 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 no. I think what would be much more uh, helpful, and I'm willing to be wrong, but I haven't come across anything better yet myself, is public awareness of this is a compulsion. It's a fixation. It will not necessarily make you happy. In fact, it's very, very likely to make you really quite lonely. And it's very, very likely to make you feel quite desolate. And there are other things people get fixated on. And if you look at their lives, you'll realize you would be better off dealing with your fixation than trying to um, feed it. And that's where the public awareness should be. So that should be just just like I think they did it kind of with antidepressants. That it used to be antidepressants. Prozac were just happy pills. And then they realized, ah, it's just a bandage on a wound. You still have to deal with your wound. You know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. we're getting there with that message. Mm -hmm. I think the same message, it's the very same. It's medicalizing is a, is a choice people can make, but the, the, the issue that required the medicalization will stay. Yeah. And you still have to deal with the wound. The wound won't go away and the wound is manifesting in this way and it could manifest in other ways. And the more you can deal with the wound, the better. Exactly. I, I was actually blown away. Just yesterday, I was listening to your guys' episode with um, the Dutch doctors, and that that in, in the, um, that one uh, Thomas. I don't remember the the, the the man's name, but he was basically okay. Okay, and uh, you, I think it was you, or maybe it was maybe it was Sasha who asked basically, like, you know, did you ever explore like what caused these kids' gender dysphoria to come to you in the first place? And he basically said, whatever caused the incongruence didn't matter. What mattered was treating the incongruence. And I was just like, oh wow. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, uh, I, th I think I think. I th uh, of on. all the interviews we did, and we've done 70, I think we're taking our break at 70, so we've recorded 70, unbelievable. Um, that, to me, was the hardest interview, the most interesting interview, the most important interview. Oh, my God, I felt like a boxer before a world title, you know, with a white towel around before, before trying to get it right and trying to ask the right questions. I found it incredibly difficult. But they were very generous with their time, and they really did try to answer everything but what I felt what came out of that was a really, I felt I was slap up against the medical model. And the <clears> medical <throat> model basically says, we medicalize whatever problem you come in with. So if you, Aaron, come in with OCD, we'll medicalize that. And if the other Aaron comes in with anxiety, we'll medicalize that. If that doesn't work, we'll adjust your medication. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, we'll adjust it again. And it's nothing, and I'm not of the medical model. I have a much more developmental understanding of pain and distress. And so I was just face up against the medical model where they were just going, well, you just, of course, you mm -hmm. look for the medication to fix the issue. And then you look for more medication to fix it. So when I was pointing out, but the, you know, the, ro the results are, are, aren't great. They were going, well, yeah, irrelevant. We, we've nothing better to give them. It's like, well, we gave them a Panadol and now we'll give them more Panadol. We don't have anything else. And I'm like, but you have, you have mental, you have psychotherapy. And they're like, they just don't get it. They don't mm -hmm. think much of it. They think it doesn't work. They think all we need is the medication. Where's the medication? And all we have to do is adjust to what is the correct medication. And I'm not of that school of thought. <sighs> it was and shocking. The, and the 
And they still fall back on the gay conflation too, because it's like, oh, well, well, like you can't change somebody's sexuality. So of course the, the, the gender incongruence has to be, has to be treated with medication because you can't undo the incongruence just like you can't undo somebody's sexuality. And so it's like the two go hand in hand there and, and propagate each, you know, prop each other up. By the way, you're taking up on something that I don't think many people did take up on with the podcast, which is Steensma. Well, I don't know. Well, anyway, Steensma is part of the DSM, the new uh, DSM that has yet to come out. And he spoke about gender incongruence the entire podcast. And he never mentioned gender dysphoria. And I went, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Clearly, okay. the DSM is going to be gender incongruence. It's just the way he spoke. I was like, well, there's my answer. I wanted that. I wanted uh, to know what way. Yeah. What I thought it was maybe a sense? Dutch thing, but now, now it's branding. It's positioning. <laughs> I, very definitely. Yep. It was really noticeable because DeVries, who isn't on the DSM team, kept on calling it gender dysphoria. We were calling gender uh, dysphoria, and he kept on talking about gender incongruence. And I was like, all right. I noticed that about the WPASS SOC 8 to the draft that came out. They, they were referring to incongruence, not okay. gender dysphoria. Yeah, we, we did an episode with uh, Sinead and Janet uh, tearing apart the 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 sock eight. Um, yeah, that's a that was a that was a depressingly fun time. <laughs> Dublin, I'm from Dublin, and we say it's a good bad buzz. It's a good yep. bad buzz. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, Stella, I really enjoyed that. Taking your time out of your day to talk to us. Yeah. We've been talking about doing it for a long time and I'm so glad we have. I'm so glad we have. It was just my scattery nature, but I'm really, really glad we did it. Me too. Me too. It was good. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.